Welcome to the Celtics Pod. I'm Eric Vandenbosch. Boston Celtics basketball, it has arrived. It's not exactly the regular season, but who cares? I certainly don't. Celtics uh, tipping off their preseason schedule Whoop. Monday nights uh, versus the Hornets at TD Garden. And I'm super excited to finally see these guys play. You know, it's been great talking about all the things that have happened in the offseason. Uh, but now it's the time to see these guys actually out there on the floor. You know, we've wondered, what is it going to look like? What is this new big three going to look like? What are these young guys going to look like? Well, now we're going to know. You know, I mean, it is a preseason. It is preseason night one on Monday night. So we're, we're not going to know. We're not, it's not, they're not going to be midseason form. We'll get an idea of certain things, like what the starting lineup might be or something like that. Uh, we'll get an idea, but uh, obviously a long way to go. Uh, getting underway, getting this season underway, following uh, following all the things that have happened during the offseason and that long um, you know, run into the playoffs for the Celtics last year, it's almost like the season never ended, and now we're getting ready to play again. So after the Celtics get booted out of the playoffs versus the Cleveland Cavaliers, um, Celtics start making roster moves. And the first thing they do is they look to the draft and they uh, trade out of the number one spot. Pass up on Markel Fultz. A lot of people you know, were skeptical. Maybe they still are. But that was big news. They trade out of that number one spot pick up Jason Tatum. Jason Tatum just showing flashes of just offensive brilliance at Summer League. Some of the individual skills were just so good. And then you got free agency, got the big signing of Gordon Hayward. Then you got uh, the trade of Avery Bradley. Celtics had to do that deal because they needed to clear cap space and Danny Ainge loves to break your heart. He does, man. Somebody's going to make the tough decisions. Somebody's going to remember that it's about winning championships. It's not about Eric's favorite players. Eric loves IT. We all love IT. But it's about winning championships. So that's why you make moves like trading IT for Kyrie Irving. You know, you don't get guys like Kyrie Irving very often. Kyrie could be an elite player. He's one of the best players in the NBA. Kyrie wants to get to that level where he's up there with LeBron, Steph Curry, Russell Westbrook, and he feels like he can do it, and he thinks that this is the place to do it, that this is the coaching staff that will help him get to that next level, help him become a better basketball player, help him become a true point guard. He, uh, he seems very excited about being in Boston. You know, it was a good situation for him. He didn't have any control. He didn't have a no-trade clause. And he took a big risk, and it seemed to pay off. Seems to be a situation that he is just thrilled about. So all of these things have happened with the Celtics, and now we get to see some preseason basketball. And I am even more excited about preseason than I was the Summer League, and people thought I was crazy for being about Summer League, but that's about watching individual talent. It's not about watching high-quality basketball. So Celtics wrapping up uh, training camp. Thursday at Salve Regina University in Newport, Rhode Island. The Celtics under Doc Rivers used to practice at Salve. But when Brad Stevens came along, he moved training camp to the practice facility in Waltham because he thought it was just, I guess, more practical or whatever. But they decide to go back to Salve after the Kyrie Irving deal because there are just so many new faces. You know, guys need to get to know one another. They had a very good locker room last year with so many guys who seemed to play hard for one another, seemed to like being around one another. And now it's time to start building that new bond in the Celtics locker room. And that starts with spending some time together at Salve, hanging out for a couple of days, eating meals together, doing all those things, you know, as opposed to practicing in Waltham. You practice in Waltham, and then, you know, practice is over, and everybody goes off to their separate homes. Uh, But this was an opportunity for the team to uh, get to know one another. And we will get to know the Boston Celtics Monday night. Many things to be interested in, things to keep an eye on during these preseason games. One of them is the starting lineup. What will the starting lineup be? 
it seems likely that we have Kyrie Hayward, Marcus Morris, Al Horford uh, right now, not telling you who the number two will be because I don't know for sure. It's uh, Jalen Brown, Marcus Smart. That's the battle people are saying. That's It's going to be one of those two guys. You can make a case for either one of them to be your starting two. I wouldn't be surprised if they start with Marcus because he's an elite defender and he's got more experience in the NBA. Maybe that's the case. Maybe it's not. Maybe it is the case to start. And then later on, they make a move to uh, Jalen Brown. But Marcus, you know, that elite defender, that really pesky basketball player, that guy that people love to see play defense because, you know, the guy that can swat the ball away from people and rip it out of your hands and then make a pass up the floor as he's falling down. You know, Marcus diving for loose balls. All these things are so much fun to see. You know, Marcus makes big plays and frequently they lead to fast break points. So he's got, uh, you know, he's got those, makes those big plays defensively. Championship team needs those guys like that. They need those kind of players and those kind of plays. Marcus can bring that. He's also a good passer. He's a good ball handler as well. He's capable of being a primary ball handler. Can't shoot though. (laughs) Marcus doesn't seem like he's shown a ton of development in his shot since he uh, came into the NBA. Last season, he shot just 28% from three-point range, and that is low. That's not good. 28%'s bad. It's bad. And this is a team that shoots a ton of threes. They need better shooting than that. And Jalen Brown, maybe he can give you better shooting. He shot 34% from three-point range, a lot better than Marcus. Still some room to grow, though, but it sounds like he has potential to become a better shooter. Like uh, coaches say, he's got great mechanics. He's got what you need to develop a good shot. So already shooting better than Marcus from behind the arc anyway, and apparently enough potential there where coaches talk about it. He does add size and length. He's six foot seven. That's a good size in the backcourt there with uh, Jalen and Kyrie, who is six foot three, much bigger than last year's Avery Bradley, six two, Isaiah Thomas, uh, whatever his height is, and it's small, five foot nine. But Jalen, a very athletic basketball player, can get up and down the floor really well. Good in transition. Versatile player. Uh, the number four spot, that would be power forward. That would be Marcus Morris. And number five would be Al Horford, your center. That's not a bad duo, I don't think. Marcus Morris brings some versatility. He can shoot the three. He can defend at the perimeter. Al Horford can stretch the floor. Great passer. Not a lot of rebounding there, though, between uh, Marcus Morris and Al Horford. And this was an area people express, expected the Celtics to address in the offseason. They kind of did and they kind of didn't. They took a step forward. You know, we thought with Ante Zizic coming to Boston that he could help, you know, to some degree uh, with the rebounding. But then the Celtics trade him away. Jay Crowder isn't a fantastic rebounder, but, you know, we expected him to play a lot of four out of necessity. And they trade him away. They brought in Aaron Baines, though, who is a very good rebounder, who is a you know backup center who will come in off the off the bench and give you some good minutes and stuff like that. But he's not a starting center, you know. Uh, perhaps he does start at center at times for the Celtics. He could do that. Uh, not expected to be a season long thing with uh, Aaron Baines at the four, Al Horford at the or excuse me, Al Horford at the four. Aaron Baines at the five, not anything anyone is expecting to see long term, but, you know, just for specific matchups, if they're facing a bigger starting unit and uh, Brad Stevens wants to start the game with some size to match up against the other team. So we could see that. Bunch of different things the Celtics could do. You know, not necessarily regarding the starting five, but the rotation. There's a lot of versatility there with the guys on the bench, and guys can play and defend multiple positions, so we'll see a lot of interesting combinations. Maybe we'll see some of those in the preseason games. You know what I'm looking forward to seeing is this uh, new and improved Marcus Smart. 
Marcus said that he lost about 20 pounds during the offseason. And he looks like he has lost weight. Like if you see any uh, footage of him practicing or if you see, you know, any footage of his interactions with the media, he looks skinnier. You can tell just by looking at him. And according to his coaches, he looks more athletic and he looks faster. So picture pesky Marcus Smart always swiping at the ball, always trying to outmuscle guys being a pain in the butt defensively. Just picture him doing that for a more extended period of time because maybe he has more endurance or he's more athletic, he's quicker. Oh, my God, what a pain in the butt that that guy is going to be to um, the players that are being defended by Marcus. And Marcus is going to need to be the best defender on the team on the perimeter because – you know, they don't have Avery Bradley anymore. They lost Jay Crowder, too. Avery Bradley, though, was a elite uh, perimeter defender. And Avery Bradley had the ability to match up with some of the better guards in the league. He's gone. Marcus needs to step up. And I feel like Marcus is uh, up to that challenge. He's already a very good defender. The athleticism, maybe that gives him extra elevation, helps him out with rebounding. Rebounders on the Celtics are asked to push the ball up the floor themselves, get out and run, get off and go. Maybe that extra quickness uh, helps him initially after that rebound, getting up the floor. Maybe that extra quickness helps him stay in front of some of these better guards. Guys like John Wall in particular. John Wall, who is... Very fast. Maybe Marcus can stay in front of that guy. But uh, he says that he struggled last season playing through exhaustion. Marcus Smart said that. He struggled with back problems because of his weight. So I'm interested in seeing Marcus Smart. I want to see him do what he does, and I want to see him uh, run around out there and flying around like crazy because according to the coaches, that's what he looks like right now. Marcus asked about coming off the bench, and Marcus is somebody who seems to say all the right things. Seems like he's a guy who really knows what the coaching staff is looking for. Seems like he really knows what the team needs him to be. And he seems to be a team-first type of guy. Isn't showing much ego when it comes to these questions about coming off the bench. He basically says, it's no big deal. It's, I, I don't have a problem with it. Whatever the team wants me to do, he said, we're all starters, or we've been starters, or we've played starter minutes. You know, he said, every, we're all interchangeable. He also said, you need bench depth, and he is fine being that bench depth. Uh, Brad Stevens needs to be able to look down the bench and find guys he is comfortable putting into the basketball game, and Marcus Smart's one of those guys. Marcus doesn't mind being one of those guys coming in off the bench. Marcus says bench depth, especially in the playoffs. And I like to see him mention the playoffs because there's a guy who gets it. It's all about the playoffs. Marcus has been there for several years. So it's nice to see Marcus in early October thinking about the playoffs. The development of the youngsters, uh, something to watch for in the preseason games. Brad says they have to expedite the learning curve for these guys who are 19, 20, 21 years old because those guys need to play. Like, they are going to need these guys to play because there are teams in the NBA that have a bunch of vets on their bench and they, they come in and they have that experience off the bench. The Celtics are not one of those teams. The Celtics have a very young bench and they need those guys to play major minutes. We're going to see Jason Tatum. We're going to see Jalen Brown. Maybe he'll come in off the bench to start or whatever. We'll see those two guys, and then we'll see Gershon Yabusele, Semi Ojale. We'll see those guys. So it's important that these guys learn quickly, and they can do so on the fly. Guys who can not only develop their game, during actual live NBA game action, develop their game, and at the same time, help the team win. That's important. They're going to rely on these guys heavily to play a lot of minutes, and they're going to impact winning. 
So, yeah, get out there. Get those NBA minutes. Gain experience. And at the same time, win games for us. One of these guys uh, to watch for, one of the young guys, Jalen Brown. I'm extremely interested in Jalen Brown. And I'm hoping that he takes a major step forward in his rookie season. I just I just like that kid. He's a very smart guy. Uh he's seems to he seems to have some really big goals. Like he wants to be a great player. You know, he's always in the gym. He's always working out. He's always watching film. Wants to be great. You know, wants to be the head of the players union one day. He's got a lot of ambition and a great work ethic. And he's uh very intelligent. He does seem to be like a natural leader. So I am very interested in the development of Jalen Brown. His development of his defense is going to be huge this year because the Celtics did lose Avery Bradley and Jay Crowder, and it's not all up to Marcus. Marcus is going to be a huge part of that. But so is Jalen Brown. His defense is going to, you know, at times determine whether or not they win a basketball game. Brad Stevens says we need him to be a high-level defender, and he's going to have a big impact on these the outcomes of these games. And Brad Stevens has been talking about Jalen Brown's defense for a while now. He, he said it over the summer. He said it at uh, training camp or summer camp, summer league. The basketball they play in the middle of the summer when it's really hot outside, the basketball people don't want to admit that they watch. I like summer league, though. I like to see these guys show off their stuff, show off their skills. Basketball is ugly, but it was sweet to watch uh, Jason Tatum knock down those fadeaway jumpers. But um, Brad Stevens says, you know, when games get late, Guys isolate more. You got to have guys who can defend one on one. And he feels like Jalen Brown can do that. There were times last year where Jalen Brown played fantastic defense. There were also other times where it looked like he still had a lot of learning to do. But the Celtics are hoping that he can be more consistent. You know, he can do it. He's got a great combination of size and athleticism. He's big enough to defend some bigger guys, he's quick enough to stick with the the fast ones. And Steven says he's going to stick with fast guys, big guys. He said he'll play a lot of twos, said he'll play some ones, and he will switch on to four. So they are going to rely heavily on his defensive versatility. He's going to get a lot of minutes, and they are really hoping for a big sophomore leap from Jalen Brown. And there is one highlight out there on YouTube that a lot of people uh, – point to when they talk about Jalen's defense and his uh, potential as a defender out on the perimeter. There was a game versus Golden State, and it's one particular uh, clip of an offensive possession where Jalen Brown is all over Steph Curry, and Curry is doing everything he can, using his great ball handling skills, trying to shake this kid, and just can't do it. Just can't get by Jalen Brown. But I'm sure we can also find some highlights there of Jalen Brown looking like a rookie too. So looking for more consistency out of him. But Brad Stevens says at this point, Jalen Brown is better today than he was this time a year ago, and he looks more comfortable. He appears to be more confident. And Jalen's working hard, putting in the time. He is developing, and that's all you can ask for out of these young guys. He does appear to be getting better and becoming a better basketball player. Shane Larkin. Shane Larkin is somebody that uh, Brad Stevens is very high on. He's talked about Shane Larkin in recent days. Somebody that the Celtics fans may not know a lot about. Somebody that doesn't really get Celtics fans very excited. But... You know, he could be a good guy to uh, have around. It can't hurt to have an extra ball handler. And uh, he's athletic. He can run pick and roll. Brad Stevens says this guy can get into the paint on anybody, and he's got a beautiful floater. 
Brad Stevens says he's got that shot, and that is a shot every small guy needs to have. And I uh, and uh, Shane Larkin can get in the paint, and he can knock down that floater. And Shane Larkin is projected to be the third point guard behind Kyrie Irving and Terry Rozier. And Steven says, when they're going really small, you will at times see Shane Larkin out there on the floor with either Kyrie Irving or Terry Rozier. So Shane Larkin has the uh, potential to be one of those under-the-radar guys. One of those guys who came in joining the team not a lot of people talked about it with all the other things going on, but then, you know, perhaps he's one of those guys that makes great plays and fans really start to like him. All you got to do is impact winning, you know, and, and fans will like you. Fans will always remember that play that you had at the end of the game that won the game for the basketball team. They'll remember that shot you made or that defense you played. And Shane Larkin, if he gets, you know, if he gets minutes every night, doesn't have to be 30 or even 20 or 15 minutes. If he comes in and impacts winning, fans will appreciate that. You know, Jonas Derebko played limited minutes, but he was always impacting winning. And people appreciated him for the role that he had. He had certain skills and he played a certain role and he was good at that one particular role. He wasn't bad coming in off the bench and giving the Celtics a few minutes every night, and, you know, shooting threes or whatever. Maybe Shane Larkin can be one of those guys. Doesn't play a ton of minutes, but comes in and, and makes good plays for the Celtics and impacts winning. Dwayne Wade, want to talk about the uh, Cleveland Cavaliers now because the Cavaliers have acquired veteran Dwayne Wade. Uh, he signs a one-year, $2.3 million contract with the Cavs after he agreed to a contract buyout and cleared waivers. He agreed to a contract buyout with the Bulls, giving back $8 million of his $23.8 million salary in 2017-2018. So LeBron, Dwayne Wade, they reunite. You know when LeBron said not one, not two, not three, he didn't sp – did he specifically say that he and Wade would win those championships in Miami? He must have. But maybe he said me and Dwayne Wade, we'll win two here, and then we'll, we'll, we'll win a couple more. So when we start talking about not three, not four, not five, they're coming in Cleveland. So he can still make good on that, that promise, right? 35-year-old Dwayne Wade – Wins the title with the Cleveland Cavaliers. Wade is 35, and he's been a great basketball player. He 23 points per game for his career, 18 points per game last year. That was his second lowest points per game average since he was a rookie. Second lowest of his career, his lowest being about 16 when he was a rookie all those years ago. Hasn't averaged 20 points per game in three out of his last four seasons. His field goal percentage last year was just 43%, which is a career low. So 35 years old, 18 minutes is still, or 18 points per game is still pretty good, but clearly, offensively, the statistics, like you would assume a 35 year old player would see, production going down a little bit. But it still gives the Cavaliers another scoring option, gives them a guy who can start basketball games. It gives them a guy who can come in off the bench. He's great friends with LeBron James. He's good to have in the locker room. He's a veteran with all sorts of playoff experience, championship pedigree, all of those things should get him on a veteran's minimum contract. It's not bad. In Cleveland, they are a formidable team. They have some good players on that basketball team, a lot of good veterans. They will be tough to beat next season. Isaiah Thomas, while we are talking about uh, the Cavaliers, going to bring up Isaiah Thomas because it seems like we now have a timetable for IT's return. The Cavaliers said Monday they expect Isaiah to start playing in January. They actually said January 1st. 
and they weren't ruling out a return by the Christmas Day game versus Golden State. What a Christmas present that will be for me and all the IT lovers out there. If he plays on Christmas Day in a rematch of the finals versus Golden State, I will consider that a fantastic Christmas gift because I want to see Isaiah Thomas play some basketball. Obviously, if he is out there on Christmas Day, he will play limited minutes. But I want to see IT go out there, and I want to see him show us a little quick change of speeds, attack the basket, get up there amongst the trees, you know, make a difficult shot at the rim. I want to see those things. I want to see him run the floor with the ball and knock down a pull-up three-pointer. I do. I'm rooting for Isaiah Thomas all the way here. Absolutely. Uh, torn labrum in his right hip last season. Missed the final three games of the Eastern Conference Finals. Uh, decided not to have surgery. There's been all of this uh, mystery surrounding when Isaiah Thomas is going to come back. That's why Cleveland asked for additional compensation in the Isaiah Kyrie Irving deal. So it's good to see a timetable here. And it's going to be coming back in January. Certainly enough time for him to get back into playing shape and to maybe gel with his new teammates headed into the playoffs. So he can really impact that basketball team. He can help take them deep into the playoffs. If he's playing by January, he would think that he would be in better playing shape and on the same page with the teammates. And apparently, since he has joined the Cavaliers, uh, rehab has just gone fantastic for him. Apparently, things are going extremely well. He's running. He's shooting. Sources told ESPN that his rehab has gone so well in his time with the Cavs that the team has actually urged him to be patient with his return. Don't jump in there too quickly. Don't push us so hard to get on the floor because it's all about the playoffs. You know, it's all about being available in June in the finals. Uh, <laughs> championships are not won in October, November. We get to the summer. You know, hopefully uh, IT is the IT that we know. I mean, I'm not... I, I'm pretending as if I, you know, I'm a member of the Cavs right now. As as me being a member, a pretend member of the Cavs right now, I am hoping that Isaiah Thomas, you know, comes back in uh, January and then by June he's uh, in great basketball shape. Everybody's on the same page and we win games. That's what I'm hoping if I'm a member of the Cavs. Isaiah Thomas still very confident in himself. Of course he is. This is Isaiah Thomas. We know Isaiah. Isaiah says you always doubt me and I always... I always do it. You say I can't, and I do it. Screw you guys. Always counting me out, whether it's me being too short or me having this hip injury, not being able to carry a basketball team, any of these things. Screw you guys. I'm Isaiah Thomas. I'm badass. I know it. He still thinks he's uh, worthy of a max contract. And that for Isaiah Thomas, it is still possible. That could happen. Um, obviously, it may be a little bit more difficult for him to get a max deal if he's not scoring 29 points per game. You don't have to score 29 points per game to get a max contract, but it's certainly he seems more worthy of a max contract when he's playing on the Celtics where he is forced to be the guy who single-handedly wins the game. You put all of that, um, that you put that burden on Isaiah to carry the team and you give him the keys to the car. And last season he took more shots than ever and he had his highest field goal percentage and and he was so efficient, even given the extra work, he was so efficient. You know, a season like that, that will get you a max contract. He's not going to have the season he did last year because there are miles to feed in Cleveland, including LeBron James, especially LeBron James. So he can't put up those numbers. So that will hurt a little bit with him uh, trying to get a max contract. But everyone knows what he's capable of. And if he shows that he can get back to that point, you know, somebody is going to pay for and they're going to want a guy who can score 20 plus points per game because he's he as long as he shows that he can do this like January through the playoffs as long as he shows that he's still capable of attacking the basket finishing 
as long as he shows that he still has his quickness and he can shoot off the dribble and knock down pull-up threes, and as long as he can show that he's capable of taking over stretches of games and that he is capable of being a consistent scorer. Yes, these, these things would be more difficult to do with LeBron out there, but as long as he shows he is capable and he's athletic enough to do these things, maybe he gets that max contract. Because, you know, I mean, you, you need to have consistent scores, guys who consistently score 20-plus points every night. If you want to win, if you want to go deep into the playoffs, you need these guys. You need star players because star players, they take on more of the the burden you know they allow other guys on the team to be themselves and to not have to do too much and go beyond their abilities they allow those guys to be themselves while those star players are the ones who really carry the basketball team you need several of those you know one great player is not as good as having two great players you need guys like this so if you can get a consistent score in Isaiah Thomas who score 20 plus points per night if he shows he's capable of doing it, you know, maybe he does get that. Max contract, Brinks truck. It seems to be very important to Isaiah Thomas. Maybe it's respecting. Maybe he sees getting a max contract as, you know, people have, uh, you know, I've got this max deal. People know how good I am. They know how great I am. That's why I get all this money. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's uh, that, you know, maybe it's, him feeling like uh, people count him out and he wants that max deal. Uh, maybe he just wants to be rich. <laughs> but either way, either way, he does talk about the Brinks truck. He does talk about max deals. He's still doing it, so he wants it. And uh, you know, at the very least, Isaiah's going to fight for it. He's going to give it everything he has. He's going to try and get it. All right, I'm uh, Eric Vandenbosch, and uh, that's uh, it for me. We got uh, Celtics' uh, first preseason game Monday night versus the Hornets TD Garden. All right, the games are underway. So excited about this. Uh, until next week, take her easy. Go Seas.